Well, let's jump into the message for today. You can see on your screen that we're doing... <laughs> My wife reminded me that I'm supposed to mention that uh, this we- weekend I uh, participated in my first jiu-jitsu tournament. <laughs> <laughs> and I won, so <laughs> uh, there was only one other guy in my division, but I did have to beat him twice to, to win, so, <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, we're going to get into the message, because that's why we're here. <laughs> um, we are doing uh, in, in Good Faith, Our Love is Our Witness, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we started a few weeks ago, Pastor Burton actually kicked off the message, and uh, he shared with us that, that throughout the series we were going to talk about how we need to relate to neighbors, strangers, and enemies alike, and we need to relate to them with kindness, with sincerity, and most of all with Christian love. And uh, that's kind of been the basis of this whole um, a whole series is showing good faith is humble but powerful way to live out our faith. Because how many of you guys know that once we're saved, once we've given our life to the Lord, that's only step one. That's the starting line. Then we have to live out that faith. And so we read Mark 12, 28 through 34, which is where our church gets our mission statement. And it's also referred to in scripture as the greatest commandment. And it is love God and love others. And uh, here at Life Christian Church, we kind of just drill that main idea because how many of you guys know that sometimes it is very valuable to get back to the basics? We can see shiny things and see rabbit trails and, and run here and there looking at all this stuff, but the foundational stuff oftentimes gets forgotten. And so the most uh, foundational thing about the gospel and about being a Christian and being a believer is loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and loving others, loving our neighbor as ourself. And so Pastor Burton shared about that, and he talked about how our actions are much more important than our words. How many of you guys agree with that? Man, people can talk a big talk, but sometimes they don't do what they say. Talk can be very, very cheap. He also pointed out that loving God and loving others is a simple idea, but it's something very hard to actually do. Well, welcome to being a Christian, right? The whole Bible is that. (laughs) For the most part, even though some people talk about the mysteries of the Bible and trying to figure out what it says and all that, a lot of it is very straightforward, The problem is doing it. (laughs) The problem is not understanding it, but it's executing. And then on week number two, I had the honor of sharing the message, and we read through the Beatitudes in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. That's found in Matthew 5, uh, 3 through 16. Our big idea that week was that Jesus instructs His disciples in a distinct lifestyle of living out what Jesus expects will point others to Him. And we read a scripture about how when we do good deeds, it will cause the people around us to actually give praise to God. Our application or challenge or action step uh, that week was that as followers, we must trust in Jesus' example as the foundation for how we live. If we don't think that Jesus is worth emulating, then what are we doing? But Jesus' example is what we're supposed to do. Our commitment to Christ is displayed in the way we treat others. When we treat other people well, they notice. And not only them, but the people around us, they notice. And it brings glory to God. Last week on week number three, I shared about loving our enemies, which uh, we had a huge altar call because nobody wants to do that, right? (laughs) Everyone had to repent about uh, hating their enemies. But that used to be how people thought. And Jesus came and he said, hey, listen, you used to hear it taught that you're supposed to love the people that love you and you're supposed to hate your enemies. But he said, I say you have to love everybody. And we read uh, Matthew 5, uh, 43 through 48, and our main idea was that Jesus wanted His disciples to be so different from the world that they knew that even their enemies would feel their love. That's a test. Our challenge was loving our enemies as ourselves means that we have to learn to love ourselves and we have to treat our enemies no less than we would treat ourselves. I mean, that's back to the golden rule, right? When you're a kid and you're learning the basics, That's one of them. Treat people how you want to be treated, not how they treat you. If we treated everybody how they treat us, we would have an even worse, evil, destructive world because people are becoming less and less kind and less and less loving. 
less and less gentle. We're supposed to do what we know is right, not do what everybody else does, because there's a lot of knuckleheads in this world. We emphasize that we have to actually do these things. This isn't just some flowery talk that we talk about on Sunday mornings to give us warm fuzzies. This isn't just some distant philosophy or abstract idea. These are basics that we have to actually do. In accepting God's love, we admit that we were enemies of God too. He doesn't call us to do something for Him that He hasn't already done for us. When we were His enemy, He loved us and accepted us. And that's what we're supposed to do too. We're supposed to love the people in our life despite how they treat us. And basically, that gives us, or gets us to week number four, which is today. And the message that I want to share with you this morning is love for the, out, uh, the world outside. And I want to start by reading 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. Uh, this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church, and it's quite a chunk of Scripture. And so uh, I want to read it slowly and intentionally, and I want you guys to really focus on the Scriptures, because how many of you guys know that God's Word is very important? Much more important than anything that I'm going to say today. And so when we're reading God's Word, we all know that this is good stuff, <laughs> and that we should listen with our minds, we should listen with our ears, we should engage with our hearts and our spirits. And so I'm going to start with verse 11, and it says, Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If, you, if it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And I want to pause right here before we go on because if we're living so distinctly like we're called to, if we're loving others in this this wild way, we're going to look crazy. Because how many of you guys know that people in this world don't treat each other well? And so if we're loving like Jesus, if we're loving like God, it's going to seem insane to some people. But I want to be crazy then. <laughs> I want people to look at me and say, what is wrong with this guy? Because of my love though. Not because I'm acting like a goober but because they see something that's so different and out of place in such a wicked world, in such a dark place, the light should be noticeable, right? He goes on to say, and if we're in our right minds, it is for your benefit. And then verse 14, either way, <laughs> whether people think you're crazy or not, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who received his new life will no longer live for themselves. Once we're saved, once we have acknowledged what God has done for us, we're not supposed to live for ourselves anymore. He is our Lord and Savior. A lot of people want a Savior, right? Please help me. They want to be saved. But he's supposed to be Lord and Savior. They don't get the Lord part. Lord is when you get on your knees and you say, I am yours. What would you have me do, Lord? That's the hard part. The saving part is easy. You, you flail around, you reach out your arms, and you get saved. Everyone wants that. But who wants to lay down their life? Who wants to take up their cross daily and follow him? He died for everyone so, th so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, pause, they will live for Christ <laughs> who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. Remember, even up to Jesus' death, they were still questioning. And they're like, what do you mean you're going to die? Because they still didn't get it. 
It says, at one point we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently do we know Him now? Well, what made the difference? Well, we're going to get into that. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought, uh, brought us back Himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to Him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassador. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so we could be made right with God through Christ. So this morning, our big idea is that the church is the visible sign of Jesus in the world, so we must focus our efforts on giving people an opportunity to be reconciled with God. Who's the church? It's us. We are the church. And what does it say in the main point? We are supposed to be the visible sign. If people are looking for Christ, if they're looking for God, where else should they be looking but to His church? Is that what they're seeing, though? Are we a city on a hill? Are we a light shining in the darkness? We need to make sure that we are focused on efforts to giving people the opportunity to have this reconciliation to God. As believers, we must remember that we would not know Jesus unless someone had shared with us the truth, the good news. Sometimes I think that we, we, we just get too caught up in ourselves and we, we, we forget that we were lost without God and that someone had to show us His love and share the good news with us so that we could be saved. And we just think, all of a sudden, one day I was enlightened. <laughs> well, that's not how it usually happens. I mean, God can come to you in a vision. He can catch something on fire. God can do whatever He wants. But most of the time, it's because someone who loves you shows you the love of Christ and shares the gospel with you. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. So that's our challenge for today. If you're writing something down, write this down. We need to hunger for opportunities to tell the world of God's great love. We need to hunger for those opportunities. That's the one thing that everyone's so scared of. People are like, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm doing my part. But man, I ain't going to tell nobody about it. <laughs> it's scary, right? To put yourself out there. Well, Paul's emphasis in this uh, section of Scripture is about his concerns with the Corinthian church, uh, the, the concerns that they were having about him because he was radical. How many of you guys have ever read about the Apostle Paul? This guy was radical, right? He had his Damascus Road experience, and that changed him. When he was made new, he was new. <laughs> A lot of us became new, and no one noticed. <laughs> But that's not the way it's supposed to be. So he was, he was getting a hold of the Corinthian church, and, and, he, and he was uh, serving them in ways that maybe they weren't used to. And they were experiencing things that maybe uh, they weren't used to. So Paul's rationale had to do with his heart to serve Christ first and serve them second. And that's what we need to do. We need to do what God says first in our pursuit of serving others. Sometimes people don't understand why followers of Christ serve in the way that they do. Sometimes, uh, I've used this example before, but sometimes someone gets radically saved and they are radically changed. And they start wanting to tell everybody about Jesus. They want to witness to everybody. They're talking about scriptures and other Christians around them are like, oh, look at this guy. Oh, he'll settle down. <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be okay. It's like, no. <laughs> That's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be excited. We, when we hear from the creator of the universe as we read his word, that's not awesome. <laughs> I mean, wow. When we come in here and we feel the presence of God as we sing songs and we feel God's presence and the Holy Spirit, that should get us riled up. We should be excited. And that's what's happening is the, the church is experiencing these things. Um, theologian N.T. Wright 
explains the gospel is not just a mechanism for getting people saved. This isn't, uh, uh, when I was in Bible college many, many years ago, uh, we read a book about discipleship, and one of the examples in the book was about a shoe factory and how the process of getting saved and, and uh, getting people discipled was very mechanistic, like, like producing shoes. And when I read that book, I was like, I don't know if that's really how it happened. When I read the book of Acts, it seems a little bit different. It seems a little bit more radical, and it seems a little bit more messy. And uh, so... That's what N.T. Wright is kind of uh, implying here. He says the gospel is not just a mechanism for getting people saved. It's not just checking boxes and establishing a spreadsheet. He goes on to say, it is the announcement of a love that has changed the world. (laughs) That's something to get excited about. A love that therefore takes the people who find themselves loved like this and sends them off to live and work in a totally new way. Not slightly, in a totally new way. The energy to get up and go on as a Christian, as one who works for the gospel, therefore comes not from a cold sense of duty, not from a fear of being punished if you don't do your bit, but a warm-hearted response of love to the love which has reached out, reached down, and reached you. Some of us have forgotten what it means to be reached down and pulled out of the muck and mire. We've just kind of been going through the motions every week. Oh God, you're awesome. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Look at all the miraculous things. (laughs) We're supposed to be excited about these things. We all feel the pressure of living for Christ in our lives in such a way that others look at our lives and ask deep, intentional questions. Or at least that's the way it should be, and that's a good thing. When people see us, they should be like, there's something different about you. There's something, I can't put my finger on it. You're weird, that's for sure. But, uh, but it's a good weird, and I can't figure it out. And then we should say, I can tell you what it is. It's Jesus. It's because I don't have a heart of stone. I have a heart of flesh. It's because I've been made new. It's because I've been radically changed on the inside. And it can't help but to come on the outside. Our understanding of the call to live for Christ is what pushes us to love others in ways that might seem otherwise inexplicable. Loving others through hardship, sadness, and betrayal seems very different than loving them through a season of ease or joy or comfort. This is the messiness I'm talking about. How many of you guys have ever had a friend that needed help and uh, you had to have more than one conversation about it? Or maybe it took uh, a year to, uh, to figure it out rather than uh, it being super easy and getting done in one weekend. That's life. When we're ministering to people, when people are are trying to give their heart to the Lord, when they're trying to get their life back on track, it's a mess. It's not easy. It doesn't take the time that we would like it to take. But that's what's awesome about it. Paul seems to argue that the love we live out is the same Because our love pushes us forward. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.14 this. It says, either way, Christ's love controls us. So some of us are not going to be too wild. Because we all have different personalities. But our intentions should be out there. Our intentions should be radical. Now, we're not all going to uh, uh, put those intentions into practice in the same way. Because some of us aren't as outgoing as other people. Some of us have different personalities than others. But our intentions, our goals, should be to spread the love of God, the love that we've experienced. Bible commentator Colin uh, Cruz writes this, quote, It is Paul's recognition of Christ's love uh, shown in his death for all, which acts as the motivation for his ministry. Paul recognizes that Christ died for us and rose again, and he can't help but to tell people about it. 
recognizing that the greatest display of God's love can be found in the Son dying for the sins of all humanity, and as the only means to correct what sin has done to creation, is vital to understanding what life is all about. Without the critical link to each of our lives being found in the death of Jesus Christ, we all walk without direction or even the hope of direction. There is nothing in this life more important than the gospel. There is nothing in this life more important than telling the people you care about about Jesus so that they can be reconciled to him. In Jesus' death, however, all humanity has hope if we are willing to place our trust in Jesus. Beyond the death of Jesus, we find our true hope is answered in his resurrection. This is the exciting part. People have come and gone, right? Great leaders, even spiritual leaders. But something happened that was different with Jesus. His resurrection points to the confirmation that his death was sufficient. Jesus died for our sins and they were washed away, but he rose again to say, and now you know it's true. When we give our heart to the Lord, when we uh, believe in our hearts and declare with our mouths that He is Lord, how do we know it works? Because He rose from the dead. (laughs) Because He was resurrected. and And the Bible tells us that that same resurrection power is in us when we put our faith and trust in Him. God promises He has fulfilled His promise, and our future hope for all believers is rooted in the same resurrected Jesus. I want to quickly reread 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. It says, Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive His new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was uh, raised for them. While we uh, will spend our lives learning to, to die to ourselves, it's an ongoing process. Actually, between the services, I was talking to someone and I was saying, uh, I was just reassuring him, you are saved. You believe it. You've declared it. You are saved. But now you're becoming a lifelong process, a disciple of Christ. Sanctification is an ongoing thing. We become more and more like Him. We spend our lives learning to crucify the flesh, to deny ourselves, and to be more like Jesus. We have no fear in our salvation. We shouldn't. We know that He died. We know that He rose again. That's done. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. We are saved if we put our faith and trust in him. This makes all the difference in how we understand our lives and our lives for others. I want to reread the second half of the passage that that we've been working on here just so that we can get that in us. I want to start with verse 17 uh, of uh, 2 Corinthians 5. It says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. How many of you guys know that we don't do that all the time? (laughs) Lots of times we see people through our own eyes. We see people through our humanness. And that's that's why we, we write them off, right? That's why we avoid them. That's why we stop talking to them. That's why we start saying, oh, well, no, I'm not going to share the gospel with them. I'm not going to open myself up to them. But this says we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, and the old life is gone, the new life has begun, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. We are in a partnership. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are supposed to be working with Him in this awesome task of uh, reconciling people to Him. Verse 19, For God was uh, in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. 
We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. As members of the new creation, we cannot look at people the same way. We cannot look at them through the lens of humanity. It pushes us to love them as Christ loved us. We are supposed to love as we are being loved, not as people deserve. Because how many of you know none of us deserve anything? All of this is rooted in the person and character of God. Quoting uh, Bible commentator Cruz one more time, he says, quote, uh, Wherever the language of reconciliation is found in the New Testament, God is always the subject of the uh, reconciling activity. There is no hint that Christ is the gracious one who must overcome unwillingness on God's part to be reconciled with sinful humanity. It is God Himself who initiates and affects the reconciliation through Christ. On the other hand, this does not mean that there existed no obstacle on God's part that had to be overcome by reconciliation uh, to be effect, uh, on humanity. God's wrath revealed from heaven against the wickedness of humanity had to be dealt with. So what does that mean? It means there was a price that had to be paid. Our sin had to be paid for. And Christ paid that price so there could be justice. If there is injustice to to make things right, it has to be paid for. And Christ paid the price for our sin. Paul writes in Romans 1.18, But God shows His anger from heaven against all sinful and wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. He continues in Romans 5, uh, 9-11 9-11 through 11 with this, And since we have been made right in God's sight uh, by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us uh, from God's condemnation. For, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son, while we were still enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of the Son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. We were enemies of God in our sin, and we were made right when Jesus died and rose again, and now we are friends with God once again. What is stressed in the present passage is the amazing grace of God revealed when He Himself took the initiative in Christ to remove the obstacle of reconciliation existing uh, on His part. It is only on this basis that there exists a gospel of reconciliation by which humanity can now be called and reconciled by God. People will see followers of Christ in many uh, ways, but the love of Christ should always be what comes to mind. When people see us, they should see first and foremost God's love. Our character, our actions, our attitudes are all the outflow of our understanding of God's love for us as expressed through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The world longs to see, whether they know it or not, a display of God's love to them in Jesus Christ. And we are called to see people in the terms of God's love for them, not in the terms of our experiences with them. People are hungry and thirsty for God. Many of them don't know it, but they are. They feel that void. You know it. You see people in, in your lives that are, that are grasping and trying to figure out what's going to make them whole. And they, they look for it in all the wrong places, like the old song, looking for love in all the wrong places, right? They're, they're seeking the love of God, but they're looking for it everywhere else. And where are they supposed to be finding it is through us. Because God's love is reflected through us. We are the tangible uh, uh, manifestation of God's love. But some of us aren't working very hard at it. (laughs) As we consider the depth of God's love for us, it it uh, it, it should be natural to bubble over. And we've talked about this many times. We are supposed to be so full of God's love and and zeal that it splashes. 
right? We should have blue paint with us wherever we go so that we can, we can paint around us and, and, and let people know you're in the splash zone. Because it should just be coming out of us. Now, I know we have struggles and we go through bad days and all that kind of thing, and sometimes you wake up and you're a little bit grumpy. But overall, man, we're supposed to be consumed and overflowing with God's love for others. Other people matter to God just as much as we do. We live in a society that's all about me, 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 me. That is the opposite (laughs) of God and God's plan and God's word and what it means to be a Christian. I want to begin to wrap things up by reading 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 12. This is another big chunk. And so I want you guys to focus, and and you can read along on the screen, or you can just close your eyes and and listen to me uh, fumble and bumble through it. But I want to read this because God's Word is so important. He he says this in, in 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 12. Paul's writing again, and he says, As God's partners, we beg you to not accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. That's where we all are, right? If you've given your heart to the Lord and you've received new life, it's time to do the next step. It's time to stop ignoring it. Verse 2, For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored, even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are pure, Uh, We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, yet we have everything. And we'll just uh, uh, move along here. Um, One last time, I want to review our big idea, and that is the church, us, the people in this room, uh, the people who are a part of the body of Christ. We are the visible sign of Jesus in the world And so we must focus our efforts on giving people an opportunity to be reconciled to God. Also, I don't want us to forget that as believers, we must remember that we should not know, uh, we would not know of Jesus unless someone told us. We didn't just get it by osmosis, most of us, right? And so our challenge is that we should hunger for opportunities to tell the world of God's great love. We should be sniffing out and seeking out opportunities to tell people about the good news of the gospel. Now, before I close this message uh, with prayer, I want to share this, the message of reconciliation that we've been talking about. I want to give an opportunity right now to briefly explain what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and to be born again, to be made new, to be saved, just as we keep reading about what it means to be a Christian or a Christ follower. I want to offer that opportunity to everyone hearing this message, either in this room or online or whatever. I want to talk about how we can become, uh, we can go from being an enemy of God to being a friend of God. And so just as we read today, this this is the story. This is the good news of the gospel. And that is God created us to be with him. He wanted us to be in a love relationship with him. And it started out that way. God said it was good. And then he gave man a choice. And man 
unfortunately made a bad choice. He chose himself over God and sin came between us and the Lord. And our sin separates us from God. And sin can't be removed by our good deeds. We have nothing in our own power to get rid of that, that barrier between us and God. But just as we read today, paying the price for our sin, Jesus died and he rose again. So everyone and anyone who puts their trust in Jesus Christ alone has eternal life. And that eternal life starts right now and it, and it lasts forever. The Apostle Paul, who we were reading from earlier, he wrote in Romans 10.9, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And remember we talked, this is the simple part. If you believe it, if you believe it and you declare it, you're saved. And then the real journey begins. So I want to give everybody in this room and anybody who might be hearing this the opportunity to do that right now. And I'm not going to uh, lead you in a prayer. I'm not going to uh, put anything on the screen or have you sign a card or anything like that because I want it to be between you and God. If you're really declaring that, if you're really saying, I believe it, then I don't need to know about it right this minute. <laughs> and so in your words, from your heart to your mouth and to God's ear, I want you to declare it to him. Say, Jesus, I believe you died for my sins and you rose again. It's as simple as that. 